Now, we have a really important meeting today. Uh, you know, <clears throat> we have a, an ongoing discussion in this country about an energy policy. Well, I'll tell you that the United States of America does not have a coherent energy policy. I mean, when we're talking about algae, <laughs> pond scum, buying barnyard fertilizer, I mean, we have people at the highest levels of government actually with a straight face trying to tell us that's their plan. <laughs> Folks, that is no plan. So we need to have a discussion about jobs, about energy independence, and energy independence is all about American sovereignty. I hope you understand that. It's about American sovereignty. It means that we won't have to bow down to anybody. Amen. All right? It's also about environmental hazards. It's about private property rights. And then there's this really scary word that's been going around called tar sands. I mean, there's this big monster. I'm sure kids that have heard that think there's some great big blob that's going to take over the United States or something called tar sand. Look, in the interest of full disclosure, I used to work in the oil and gas industry. And I was in accounting and, you know, paper pushing and, and management and all that. But I will tell you, that when I went into that job, I wanted to learn everything about the field operations. I didn't want to just push paper. I didn't want to just try to manage people out in the field if I've never been out there. Okay? So I went out. We, we did the exploration. We did the drilling. We did the operation. And I'll tell you, I shocked an old drilling superintendent early in my career because there was a wildcat that was going to be drilled one night. There was high hope that we were going to discover a new field. And back in the 80s, women just didn't go out on drill sites because there was this old myth that if a woman showed up on a drill site, that it'd be a dry hole. <laughs> Well, this crusty old drilling superintendent, I'll never forget him, God love him and rest his soul, Wallace Furman. He was a Cajun from the deep, 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 deep south swamplands of Louisiana. And so Smarty Pants Me shows up with the vice president of operations out there. So he goes, oh my gosh, do you know what you're doing? You're just going to jinx this job. I said, no, I won't. You just hide and watch so I stayed down there that night, had my boots on. It was a muddy, muddy site. For all y'all that know the, the wonderful locations you get to go on when you're, on, when you're drilling wells. And um, it was muddy as it could be and raining to beat the band. But anyway, that was a discovery, a new discovery in a new field. It's called Roseland. It was on Roseland Plantation in Louisiana. And I will tell you what, Wallace never tried to tell me I didn't belong on the well side anymore. So today we have uh, representatives from the Keystone XL Gulf Coast Pipeline Project. And the two gentlemen that we have today are Mr. Wayne, uh, Mr. Shane Woodard. Shane is an independent Austin-based lobbyist and don't throw things at him. <laughs> That's okay. Don't, don't throw things at, at Shane today. Uh, but you be sure you ask him, ask these guys some tough questions. Anyway, Shane um, has worked in and around the Texas Capitol for 10 years before he began his lobby practice. So he knows all about that weird place we call Austin. Uh, Woodard's lobby clients are primarily in the agriculture and energy sectors. He's a native of Friona in the Texas Panhandle. He is a graduate of Texas Tech University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Ag Economics and, <laughs> and a former Tech Body Student President. And then we have Mr. James Prescott. Jim is a senior consultant on the public affairs team for the Keystone Pipeline System and he's assigned to Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. 
He's worked in public affairs for more than 25 years and has extensive experience on large-scale projects in energy, transportation, and capital development. Jim also has done international uh, work. He has experience in Europe and Australia. Now, I want you to work on your questions. I want you to feel free to ask them tough questions because what we want to get at today is the facts. There's a lot of misinformation going on out there about this project, but at the same time, we do want to know that it's a responsible project. We certainly do because we support private property rights here. So I've already had an opportunity to visit with Shane and with Jim, and they're gonna be ready to answer your questions. So you work on the questions and they're gonna take up the questions throughout the presentation. You all can come on up. And then I'm gonna ask the questions today. And so I want y'all to be sure that you ask every question you've ever had about this pipeline. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanne. You know, there's a, uh, a pipeline project you might want to work on, too. <laughs> if we need a little luck, I know who to call. It's a, a pleasure to be here uh, today. Uh, I don't think it's too late to say Happy Easter. I hope everyone had a, a, a wonderful Easter Sunday uh, and a, a blessed holiday season. Uh, it's our pleasure for Shane and I to, to be here. And uh, as Joanne said, anytime we have the opportunity to present the facts and answer questions about this project, given all the misinformation that's been out there about this project over the last couple of years, uh, we jump at the chance. So it is a... Uh, uh, a real opportunity to be here with you uh, this afternoon, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any and all your questions to the best of our ability. Uh, before we do that, I've got a couple of uh, slides, and I think I can probably just, look at that, make it work, uh, and just give you some of the facts about uh, the company, TransCanada, and the project, uh, the Keystone Pipeline System and its various pieces. Some of you may be familiar with TransCanada. This is not a, a small mom and pop startup organization by any stretch. It, uh, uh, as you can see on the map, it's got a very extensive uh, footprint, so to speak. Uh, it's been around in one way, shape, or form for about 60 some odd years. Uh, it stores the third largest, uh, it's the third largest natural gas storage operator. Uh, it's got a pipeline system of uh, 35, actually uh, more like uh, closer to 40,000 miles of the natural gas pipeline. Uh, it's one of the largest private sector power generators in North America. Uh, and in North America, it's got, uh, TransCanada has about 4,000 or so employees. In the United States, it has 1,600 employees. Its U.S. headquarters are in Houston. Uh, so uh, Shane and I get down to Houston quite a bit, um, where the project office and where the corporate uh, offices are. And given the size of the, of the, the physical assets of TransCanada in North America, uh, we've got uh, roughly 1,600 employees in all those 34 states. So uh, this is a company that has been around for quite some time and has made a considerable investment in the United States over the years. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline System is uh, a, a pipeline system of several parts. Uh, part of it's already been in service for a couple of years, coming up on two years now. The original pipeline, uh, which was built in 2008, 2009, and, and 2010, uh, if you look at that map and see that, uh, that sort of brown line that goes across Saskatchewan and then uh, uh, Manitoba and then drops down through North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and then makes that turn to the east at the Nebraska-Kansas border over across Missouri to Illinois. That's the original line. Uh, that was placed in service in 2010, um, and then uh, in 2011, uh, about a year or so ago, uh, after building about 300 miles from Steel City, Nebraska, right there at that corner, uh, at the elbow there at the Nebraska-Kansas border, uh, built about another 300 miles of pipe down to Cushing, Oklahoma. Some of you may be familiar with Cushing, Oklahoma. It is a hub, uh, both from a commercial standpoint and from a storage standpoint. They can store something like 16 million barrels of oil in Cushing, Oklahoma. So it's like an airport in a way. It's, uh, airports are run like in a hub and spoke 
uh, system where all airplanes go to one place and then they go someplace you know, to other uh, markets, other airports. Um, the pipeline system in, in, the, in the United States is, uh, and in this part of the country is much the same way. Cushing is a hub, and you look in, in Illinois, there's Wood River, uh, where ConocoPhillips is part of a consortium that operates a, a refinery there. But a little bit, uh, about 60 miles east of Wood River is a, a town called Patoka, Illinois. It's a tank farm, another storage hub. So pretty much every barrel of oil uh, throughout the Midwest goes through either Patoka or Cushing or both. And we deliver to both uh, uh, Keystone uh, Pipeline and the uh, Keystone Cushing Extension. Uh, we've got a capacity to deliver about 590,000 barrels of oil uh, through that system and have been safely delivering uh, roughly 16 million barrels of oil uh, to date uh, so far. So it has uh, been in service for about two years. What you've heard about lately in the last uh, year or so, uh, given all the uh, attention uh, that our little project has received, is the expansion of the, of the system. And there's two parts to that. One is the Gulf, what we call now the Gulf Coast Project, which is from Cushing South to the Gulf Coast Refinery Complex along uh, the Texas Gulf Coast in uh, Nederland, Texas and Houston, as well as another phase, the Keystone XL Project, which is that uh, part that completes the triangle up to the north there through Manitoba, or excuse me, uh, Montana, uh, South Dakota, and Nebraska, and connects to the existing system. Altogether, uh, we're looking to uh, uh, complete the system over the next couple of years in a couple of different parts. And to, uh, let me provide you with a little bit more detail on, on XL, the northern section. Uh, we're going to reapply for a presidential permit. Uh, originally, this whole project was uh, subject to uh, the, the application we fire, filed in September 2008. And to put that in perspective, uh, the original pipeline system, the first two phases that are in operation now, uh, those two pipelines uh, that we built and, and safely uh, constructed and are safely operating, those, uh, the presidential permit we received for that section of the pipeline uh, took about uh, 23 months to approve. Um, in January, for Keystone XL, both the north section and the south section, which was going to be covered under the same permit, we were at month 41. So it took uh, twice as long to get a no, as opposed to 23 months when we got a yes to build the first one. And uh, uh, as you have uh, noticed, it got quite a bit of attention in the in the months leading up to that decision in January. Since that time, uh, we said we would reapply. Uh, we'd consider our various options from a regulatory standpoint and what made sense. And uh, uh, what makes sense to us is to proceed. Uh, we're going to reapply for a permit for the northern section. But in the meantime, what we've done is, I'm gonna skip ahead of it a little bit, sorry, is on the Gulf Coast project, which uh, includes from Cushing south to the uh, uh, to the Texas uh, Gulf Coast Refinery Complex. Uh, we are going to build that because we don't need a presidential permit to build this part. Uh, we're already making plans to start construction um, and uh, create an enormous number of jobs. This part of the, of the project is, is a capital cost of about $2.3 billion. The entire system costs uh, about $14 billion and it'll relieve a bottleneck that's at Cushing. There's a glut of oil at Cushing. The problem there is there's not enough pipeline to get the oil out of Cushing down to the market, to the refinery market. And We're not the only pipeline proposal that's uh, in the works right now. There are others as well. And um, to build our pipeline, though, will create about 4,000 direct construction jobs. Uh, it'll create about 9,000 jobs on the uh, uh, northern section, the XL portion up through Montana, South Dakota, and Nebraska. The status of, of the Gulf Coast project is uh, we still need, whoops, jumped on me there. Uh, we need a couple of permits uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we've already started that process. Uh, frankly, we feel, we believe we're in, we're in good shape uh, and uh, anticipate getting those permits sometime uh, in the middle of uh, the summer, in the June-July time frame, 
Once we have those permits, we can start construction probably around August 1st. Um, and we anticipate putting the pipeline in service in about uh, a year or so, mid to late 2013. Some of you may know, and I bet Joanne knows, that uh, pipelines are built in sections or spreads. You know, we won't start at Cushing and just keep marching all the way south. Uh, they're built in assembly line fashion in spreads that are about a hundred miles along each. So they're built in simultaneous sections uh, with you know, bases of operation, contractor yards, con uh, construction yards. And uh, that type of activity is uh, part of the appeal of this project uh, because uh, we know that uh, folks like Tom Mullins and, and the Chamber and some of the local officials who are here today and others that are uh, uh, support this project, uh, they recognize that economic impact because when you boil it down, there are three parts to the uh, appeal of this project. The economic benefits, the energy security, and the environmental value because I was talking to the commissioner earlier, uh, chatting before lunch, that uh, pipelines are by far the safest way to transport oil. The alternative is by uh, tanker or by rail or by ta uh, you know, tanker from the other side of the world, which uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, on a, on a uh, more specific issue, and I know this is one that's uh, of some concern and some interest to a lot of folks, uh, is easement acquisition. Uh, we've acquired about 99% of it, so we've been working on easement acquisition for uh, at least three years here uh, now. This is not property we own. Uh, this is still the landowner's property. It's just like a, a, uh, an easement for a utility on your, on your uh, property, whether it's a, a telephone line or an electric line or a sewer line or things of that nature, water line. It's sort of the same thing. Uh, we just uh, have an easement that gives us access to the pipe if we need it. Uh, it's still the landowner's property. Um, and uh, that's a point that uh, sometimes gets lost in the, in the debate. Uh, and we recognize that. Um, so it's, uh, it, it sometimes can be an, an emotional issue, but I think the fact that we've got 99% of the easements in Texas and uh, the, the same amount in Oklahoma uh, demonstrates that we've been working very hard for the last three years to work in good faith with landowners. I know there's a lot of headlines out there. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, there are some landowners, uh, you know, a project this large, we've got 850 landowners in Texas. Uh, we've probably got 10 times that many landowners throughout the entire system in all nine states. Uh, it is bound to happen that we'll run, run into landowners some of whom don't <clears throat> care for pipelines, don't care for us, just uh, won't work with us, don't want to be bothered. We, we get that, we understand that. Um, but we've, I think, uh, demonstrated a, a, a strong track record of trying to work with landowners and do so in a way that we hope is fair, that we hope land, uh, landowners are fair. And you know, when you hear the headlines and you see the stories about landowners that are mad at us, um, we try and keep in mind, I guess I would ask you to keep in mind as well, that for every landowner you see like that, we've probably got 10 that liked and still like working with us. Uh, because this is, we look at this as a long-term relationship. Once this pipeline is built and it's operating, we're going to be around for a while. And it's in TransCanada's best interests with the landowners in Texas and the 40,000 landowners across North America who own the property where TransCanada has pipelines to have a, a productive, positive relationship. And uh, we'd like to think that uh, we'll have a productive, positive relationship with uh, folks in Texas. I think so far we have, but we know that controversy makes a lot of news. Um, we're here to answer your questions. Um, there's obviously a lot more detail, a lot more uh, uh, to cover with a project this big. Uh, I found, and I think Shane would agree, that it's better to get to your questions rather than to hear us ramble on. But we also wanted to make sure you had our uh, contact information uh, or go to uh, either call us, and I'll be happy to talk to you here as well, uh, but go to the uh, uh, project website to get a lot of good factual information on the project. And uh, we, I think, uh, would be delighted 
uh, to take your questions. I see some cards going around. Um, Joanne, I'm not sure how you want to do this format here, but uh, we'd be happy to talk to them. I gotta get this microphone. Uh, before I find the, the cards and the microphone and everything, go ahead and keep that. Um, address the issue of address the issue of common carrier. Yeah, I, I, there's a question before I get that, to that, Joanne. Uh, I, I'm the guy out of Austin, that blue spot in this big old red state, I must say. It is good to be in the area of the country where freedom and liberty still ring, and uh, as opposed to where I have to I am jealous. Uh, my wife grew up in Texarkana, so we get over here quite often. I grew up uh, in the Texas panhandle, as Joanne mentioned earlier. Me and Mr. Schaefer went to Texas Tech. I heard the, the guns up sign there a while ago. You gotta get your guns up when you're a level Texas Tech Red Raider. Uh, but I grew up out in the Panhandle where we didn't have any oil and gas, Joanne, but every time we went over to Borger in the Pampa area, we would smell that oil and gas and go, man, that smells like money. And I was always jealous of that as opposed to our, our uh, row crop farm uh, near Clovis, New Mexico in the Muleshoe, Texas area where we would get Saturday Night Live sometime Monday afternoon. <laughs> so with that, I, I will, the question has come up from Joanne. Go ahead and ask it on the mic there again, okay. Joanne, so everybody can hear it, and I'll try to answer that question. There have been several questions that have arisen about whether or not this pipeline fits the legal definition in the state of Texas of being a common carrier. Yeah, and I'll hit on that, and Jim, if you see something to add to jump in here common carrier has been uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that over a court case the Denbury case that was uh, that the Texas Supreme Court announced back in August in which a pipeline claimed to be a common carrier in other words carrying production in their pipeline for the public good uh, private entities like Trans Canada and other pipeline companies do have that authority when they are carrying production to markets for the public. And when, with that, uh, uh, common carrier status is the ability, and it's, it, in this case, it's 5% of the landowners and uh, about 5% of the land tracts that have been condemned uh, for this uh, project, which is about average on a linear project like a pipeline. That gives that common carrier status through the state of Texas, the, the Texas Natural Resources Code is the statute, Chapter 111, that gives pipeline companies that are common carriers that ability. And it's, a, it's as Jim mentioned earlier, it's something, the condemnation process uh, is, uh, I think our Constitution requires us to uh, pay landowners for, the, for their property. And uh, that is the negotiation. When you get the condemnation, it's just a money issue, and that's what's unfortunate. Most of our landowners, uh, more like 95% of them negotiated with us, ask us to move it to the right, to the left. Could you go over here a little further? And when you're planning those things, those are the types of things that good developers that do good linear projects like pipelines, if they're any good at it, they want to work with those landowners to set those pipes in an area that, uh, that are, are beneficial to the landowners more than where we might have originally wanted to put it. So. Uh, Trans Canada is a common carrier. Trans Canada does not own any of the oil sands production in Alberta, which by the way is the second largest oil reserves in the world. I think that is something we have not trumped enough about. Number one, who's number one with oil reserves? Schaefer, who's number one with oil reserves? You learned this in Lovell. Come on, it's Sandy Place. Middle East. There you go, Saudi Arabia. They got a lot of more sand than we got in Lovell. So, Canada, though that's another company that's, that's arm to arm with us in Afghanistan. They're in Iraq with us. So I think it makes more sense for North American energy security, Joanne, that, 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 that to be friends with, the, with our old sense friends in Alberta. But we own no production. We will be hauling for various shippers like Devon, Shell, uh, uh, Total, Exxon, Mobil, BP, Chevron, uh, those type of companies hauling their oil to the markets. All oil goes to refineries. 
refiners in this uh, country, a big bunch of them, as you know, on the Gulf Coast in Texas. Okay. What Texas refinery will process the tar sands crude? Several. Uh, Valero, among others. Uh, Motiva, Motiva uh, is another one. Um, we've got uh, uh, the XL, I keep calling it the XL, the Gulf Coast uh, uh, project from Cushing to the, uh, to the, uh, to Nederland and to Houston. It'll have the initial capacity to transport about 700,000 barrels of oil per day. And uh, uh, the, to, to Shane's point, uh, this is oil that TransCanada does not own. Uh, it's uh, oil that, uh, you know, if I'm the pipeline company and, and you're the oil company, you and I enter into uh, contract negotiations before I even apply for the permit to build the pipeline. And uh, from those contract negotiations, we've sold about 85% of that capacity. Uh, and the reason that it's so uh, attractive to oil producers is you know, we provide a, a state-of-the-art pipeline that will deliver his oil from his production fields to his refinery on the Gulf Coast. So we're a shipper. I mean, we're a shipping system. He's referred to as our customer or our shipper. Uh, and we deliver the oil to his facility to, to process and refine there. And what it will, the benefit for him is that he'll have a, a stable, reliable source of oil and a stable, reliable way to get his oil from the production fields to uh, his facility on the Gulf Coast. And it will replace, to Shane's point, uh, oil that he has to import from Venezuela or Saudi Arabia or Nigeria by tanker. Uh, it's a much more efficient, much more cost-effective way to do it, and it's a stable, reliable source of oil. And I just want to point out that uh, it's not just Canadian uh, oil sands that Keystone will deliver. Uh, right now, and I think we'll find in the years to come, that this percentage will rise. 25% of the oil in Keystone comes from U.S. sources. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, Bakken oil fields up in Montana and North Dakota. Uh, a couple of years ago, they thought they could produce, you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand barrels of oil a day up there. Now they're producing five million barrels of oil per day up there. It's the production levels are off the charts. The problem they've got with Bakken is not production, because that, it is a good thing. It's a terrific thing. It strengthens our energy security. The problem they've got is there's not enough pipeline capacity to get that oil out of the refinery market, out of the production fields, to the market. If only somebody would build a pipeline. That's where we come in. And we're going to do that. That's why we're uh, pushing to reapply for that permit uh, for the northern section to get that oil out of the Bakken deliver it to Cushing, deliver it to the markets in the Midwest, deliver it to the Gulf Coast, so that we can say no, quite frankly, to more oil from Saudi Arabia. Uh, Shane and I, <laughs> Shane and I have been working on this project. I, I've been working on Keystone for TransCanada for six going on seven years. Um, I have yet to have someone come up to me and say, we need to import more oil from Venezuela than Hugo yeah. Chavez. <laughs> and I don't think it's gonna happen today. So, and I agree, because uh, he doesn't particularly want to sell it to us and we don't particularly want to buy it from him. And if we've got a US source of oil that's growing, and we've got a friendly neighbor to the north that wants to sell the oil to us, it makes a lot of sense. Other than political reasons, what has been the most significant hurdles to gaining permits? Well, uh, politics. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, Shane, Shane's got an interesting take on this. The, the first permit I mentioned for phases one and two, that permit was approved under a president from Texas for a pipeline that went to Illinois. Now we've got a permit to get approval for a president from Illinois to deliver oil to Texas. It makes you pull your hair out. So, 
Uh, I'll let you draw your own conclusions on that analogy, but uh, I, I think that uh, there are a couple of things, quite frankly, in all seriousness, that changed the, the game. Uh, it was two years ago, almost to, to the day, when the oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico exploded. And we saw for what, two, three months, day after day after day of that video and the overwhelming media coverage of the oil spill in the Gulf and the wash, uh, there's a wash to shore on the Gulf and the moratorium and the economic impact and the environmental impact that lot. Well, that was a game changer for us. Uh, that mobilized uh, the environmental groups in Washington. Um, the, uh, the ironic thing is our draft environmental impact statement came out on a Friday. The next week is when that rig blew up. And uh, things were never the same for us after that. And the draft environmental impact statement for us was very favorable. Limited environmental impact for construction and operation. You know, it was, we were marching along in the right direction. And when that, uh, when that oil rig blew up, um, it changed everything for us. It, it certainly made anything and everything to do with oil and risk to do with oil transportation and oil production. Um, it, it elevated the entire debate uh, beyond anything that we had anticipated and, and we had to uh, change our approach from a political standpoint. And uh, it certainly slowed down the, the permitting process because as I said earlier, it took us roughly two years to get the permit for the, for the first part of the project. Uh, it took us 41 months to get to know on the second part. Okay, I, th I think that you probably answered this question. Uh, first, there's an observation. I read that the pipeline has had more environmental and economic impact studies than almost any other system. This was done over a three-year period, and the result was a report that said the pipeline will not have any negative impact. We agree. <laughs> okay, um, here's another one. This is not about the pipeline. So I don't know that we want to get into fracking today, guys. Um, actually, there's a local oil man that wants to do a presentation to you guys about uh, the fracking process. Uh, so we'll just skip this one if you don't mind, because uh, that is a whole different subject. Fracking is different from the pipeline. so. We've got enough controversy. We don't need to. Yes. So I will hold this one for the next uh, speaker on this. Regarding infrastructure, wait a minute. Regarding interaction with landowners, is eminent domain ever used? Are landowners paid for the easement or is a lease agreement used? Uh, the short answer is uh, yes, landowners are paid for the easement. It's if, as if we're buying their property but we're not taking title to that, to that property. Uh, we just have an interest in it, just like, as I said earlier, uh, a util uh, utility line. Um, and yes, landowners are compensated for uh, any, you know, in, in some cases, crop loss or crop damages. We covered nine different states, so the terrain, as you can imagine, uh, what works in Texas in terms of negotiating and what landowners in Texas are interested in is a little bit different than what they might be interested in, say, in, you know, Nebraska, uh, where it's pretty much uh, corn and corn. And, uh, <laughs> and some beans thrown in there, too. Uh, so, they're, you know, every landowner is different. And, uh, but we compensate them for crop loss or, or crop damages or other types of damages, as well as, as uh, fair market value for their property, as if we're buying their property and assess it. Uh, and appraise it in that fashion and uh, come to terms. Uh, that's the process of negotiation. Sometimes it's done over the kitchen table. Sometimes it takes a little bit more than that. Sometimes it takes a little longer than that, but that's the idea. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, and to add one thing, in East Texas, it's timber. In timber companies, uh, it's a, it, uh, that's a more expensive negotiation for the pipeline developer with the timber companies because that easement, you cannot grow trees on anymore because of the root systems interacting with the pipe. Well, to go ahead and follow up on that, I believe planting on top of the pipeline is the only thing that's not. Um, the landowner can still pasture over it, you just can't plant over it. Uh, you know, deep rooted like trees and shrubs and bushes like that can't build on it either. Um, no building. But, uh, you know, we saw, I saw a story last night on KETK 
uh, that a landowner went to uh, a meeting uh, and said, you know, that uh, can't drive a four-wheeler over that right of way. Well, that's not true. <laughs> uh, when you think about it for a second, that, uh, you know, pipelines go under roads, and railroad tracks, and everything else. So the, the notion that you can't necessarily drive a four-wheeler over the right of way for the pipeline is defies logic. Is it most of the pipeline underground? It's, it's all underground. The entire pipeline is underground. Uh, it's a uh, minimum depth of cover is four feet. Uh, the federal code is three feet. So right out of the gate, we're going deeper than we need to or have to. Uh, when we cross uh, water bodies, rivers, streams, that type of thing, um, on phases one and two, we, we cross the Missouri River twice. We cross the Mississippi to get from Missouri to Wood River and to Patoka. And it's through, as Joanne can probably tell you, uh, a process called horizontal directional drilling. And when we go under the Mississippi River, we're about 65 feet beneath the bottom, the river bottom. Uh, so uh, when we cross county roads and others, we're, we're, probably, we're significantly deeper than four feet. But minimum depth of cover is four feet. And the landowner can use the property with the only exception of not being able to build on it for obvious reasons, uh, as they did before. Okay. Since tar sands crude must be heated to flow, how hot will the pipeline be? We don't heat the oil. That's uh, a piece of misinformation that's out there. Uh, the only heat that's generated from it is from uh, the friction of movement of the oil. There's pump stations about every 50 uh, miles or so. And uh, uh, those pump stations push the oil along, but uh, you know, this is heavy oil, uh, so it moves fairly slow. Uh, it moves kind of at walking speed. A barrel of oil from Alberta to Cushing takes about 30 days to get from there to Cushing, Oklahoma. So it's moving pretty slow. Um, and the only heat that's generated from it is just mostly from natural factors. Are any landowners responsible for leaks from your pipeline on the easement you have through your property? Well, uh, the, the short answer is no. Uh, we're responsible for the pipeline. Now, uh, let me just say this, that the, the industry, not just TransCanada, but the industry finds that, frankly, most, most accidents on a pipeline are very small, by far, they're very small, less than five barrels. Uh, that's about eight, almost 90%, and the remaining 10% are maybe uh, five to 15 barrels of oil. So it's uh, a large spill is extremely unlikely, uh, but it gets a lot of attention, and we understand that. Uh, generally, uh, small uh, releases like that are the result of third parties. A landowner maybe didn't check exactly where the pipeline is, contracts with somebody to bring out a backhoe to do some work on the property, and a problem results. We're responsible for cleaning it up, uh, we will shut down the pipeline within minutes. We've done so within minutes uh, on phases one and two and, uh, and clean it up. It's not the landowner's responsibility to clean it up. If there's a third party involved, we'll sort out the responsibility and the legal liability and put lawyers to work and all that kind of stuff later. Our job is to make sure the land is restored, the pipeline is working the way we want it to, and that uh, the landowners made whole uh, so that uh, uh, we've got a good neighbor. Yeah, yeah Joanna may add that 75% of, of pipeline damage is occurred, it, it occurs from third parties, people that don't dial the, the 1-800 number to dial before you dig. And uh, growing up on a farm in West Texas where we had natural gas pipelines to uh, run it all across that we would see that quite often a plow hitting a, uh, a smaller a smaller pipeline that was um, providing natural gas to your homes and things like that, your local distribution company. Okay. We've got so many questions, I'm not going to have time to combine any, so I'm just going to try to get through here. Well, well I'll shut up. It, well, I, I wasn't trying to be rude, Shane, but I don't want to have to ask you to go through the lightning Absolutely. round. That I time. hear you. Uh, East Texas has a lot of timber farms. Can the pipeline endure tree harvesting work? 
I guess I would not be familiar with the tree harvesting portion of that. I assume we're talking about logging trucks crossing right away. Is that what is that what the question is referring to? Probably, Shane, since it's yeah. four feet under. Yeah, I would say that there's probably going to be crossings. If, remember that 83% of this pipeline from Port Arthur to uh, Cushing is along an existing pipeline pipeline right away or a utility corridor. There is very little green field cutting, if you will. Uh, so we're, there, if you if you drive down you know, 59 or any of these roads in this area, you'll see those pipeline corridors. They do make for pretty good deer hunting as well. Okay. <laughs> how, much the, that how much of the oil sand refined on the Texas Gulf Coast will remain in the United States? Well, I know this is an issue that gets a lot of attention, and there's, I think, frankly, a lot of misunderstanding there out there about it as well. Uh, we look at the oil, for, as I said earlier, it's not our oil. Uh, and, and the issue is the refiners down there have a self-interest in, in uh, uh, using oil from Canada and the United States versus oil from Mexico or Nigeria or Saudi Arabia or, uh, or Nigeria, places like that. Uh, so it's uh, much more effective, much more cost-effective, and much more cost-efficient for them to use this oil as opposed to that oil. Uh, I think you need to look at it sort of like it's a product that we manufacture here in the United States. Uh, it's made here, and uh, if it's uh, to the degree that the market is here for it, that's where the oil will go when it's after it's refined. But it's just like I think any other product that we would manufacture here, whether it's corn from fields in Nebraska that, that gets shipped abroad to other markets. Uh, there's also, it's a product that get, that uh, has the potential to be exported, and I think that that. Uh, um, is, is strengthens our economy, quite frankly, because just like the agricultural market, just like the manufacturing market, it's a product made here. And if we can sell it to other markets and bring that money back here, as opposed to buying their products and bringing their products here and sending them our money, that strengthens us, I think. But the bottom line is, Certainly that's a consideration from a technical and a design and a construction standpoint, but uh, there are so many pipelines, not just in the state of Texas, on, on fault lines, that most of which are not active. Uh, and there are pipelines throughout the Midwest, including the New Madrid. So those, those considerations, that, that issue, earthquake, is already a factor in the design and operation of the pipeline and the materials that, that are used to construct the pipeline. So worried, uh, it, it's a consideration. I, I don't know, worry is quite the right word, but it's certainly a factor. A foreign country, a foreign company does not have a constitutional right to eminent domain. How were you able to do this? Well, uh, this, the short answer is we follow the laws of the state of Texas. And you know, while TransCanada's parent company is based in Calgary, it's U.S. operations and it's U.S. company is based in Houston. It's a, it is a U.S. company that's building this pipeline. It's just like any other subsidiary uh, on a global basis. So uh, the bottom line is that we follow the laws because we should and we have to, and that's what we do. I understand that China owns the tar sands. Uh, that's uh, not quite true. Uh, China has got a, a growing investment in the oil sands, uh, but China does not own the oil sands. How is our underground water supply being protected? Will all the workers be American? 
Well, that's two questions. <laughs> uh, let me, uh, to get into a little bit of the detail, there are a certain number of conditions, and as I can, you can probably imagine, it's exhaustive in terms of the regulations and the codes and the specifications we have to follow in terms of the design, the construction, and the operation of this pipeline. This is a 4,000 mile pipeline system. We've got roughly 4,000 permits to acquire. So, uh, and then there's all the, the codes and standards that we have to meet during operations. We've agreed to meet all of those codes and standards, and then some. There are 57 additional conditions uh, that we voluntarily, on phases one and two, agreed to, to follow. And we will follow those same conditions on Gulf Coast Project as well as Keystone XL up to the north. Uh, so we're going above and beyond all of the existing conditions to ensure environmental resources like water resources, aquifers, are protected, that uh, the land is protected, that timber is protected, and that the uh, property of uh, the landowners that we cross, uh, we protect that as well. So, you know, someone made the uh, observation, I think you did, Joanne, in, a, in, uh, in your comments about that this is the, by far the most studied and analyzed and reviewed pipeline project in North America. Uh, that's a fair and accurate statement. It's also a fair and accurate statement that no pipeline will follow stricter guidelines than this pipeline system will in its current operation and future uh, phases once those are constructed. What with? There, there's, I'm sorry, there was another question. American workers? The answer is yes. And U.S. workers, American workers, quite frankly, are the best pipeline contractors, employees, laborers in the world. We have uh, agreements with uh, labor unions as well as, as pipeline companies and non-labor uh, companies as well. Uh, this, this is a project, as I said earlier, that uh, from Cushing to the Gulf Coast will put 4,000 workers on the job. The northern section will put 9,000 workers on the job. That's just on the job. Then there's another 7,000 workers that'll make all the pumps and the valves and everything else that we need for it. So it's about 20,000 workers altogether, U.S. American workers. Sounds like a good plan to end 99 weeks of unemployment. <clears throat> <laughs> what width of right of way or easement do you need? Uh, the permanent easement width is 50 feet. Uh, during construction, uh, we need another uh, 60 feet, so about 100, 110 feet uh, during construction. Uh, so, but the permanent easement is 50 feet. Pipe size. Uh, the question right out here is pipe size. It's 36 inches in diameter. Big pipe. Do you find it necessary to cut across a property owner's land, or can you most often <clears throat> build it next to a property line? Uh, it, it varies. You know, uh, and that Shane talked about working with uh, uh, landowners to try and find a, a route, uh, or as my Canadian friends would call it, a route that uh, makes the most sense for them. Uh, and we try and work with them to, you know, avo avoid a pond or avoid a clump of trees and things of that nature uh, that uh, if we can work around stuff like that. It's called tree topping. You know, if you look at a tree top, it goes like this. And so if we can tree top around a retention pond or a water pond, things like that, we try and accommodate those types of things. Okay. Um, this person says President Reagan made a law number 10-86 where only the public could own profit tax-free the pumping station profit on product moving through the line will you be part of this if so what's the group's name yeah i, I would talk to uh, i think it's mr stevens about that I, I don't know the name of that group and i'm not aware of that but i'm certainly going to follow through with him and joanne i'll cc you on that okay. when i get that i'm Is not that aware of that Al? group okay Al, we'll get that too. i'll follow through with you sir on that. Joanne, real quick on the American Jobs thing. These pump stations, and there will be six of them in the state of Texas, are all electric pumps. 
and uh, so these are on the electric co-op grids here in East Texas. So as you can imagine, they are having to spend a bunch of money that we were picking the tab up for to build out the, uh, those uh, uh, elect electric uh, lines to, to uh, provide electricity to those pump stations. We will become possibly one of the biggest customers on, the, on a couple of those co-ops for sure. So that's additional help for rural America, rural economic uh, uh, assistance that uh, I think is great for, 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 for rural uh, America. Okay, there are several questions on this card, and boy, we've got a lot to go. How is the cleanup going in Michigan? This is for Jim. <laughs> well, uh, that's not our pipeline, so let me state that right up front. I don't know, quite frankly, because it's, it's not our pipeline. Um, I know it's, uh, uh, I, don't even, I don't even want to venture as to how it's going, because it's, it's not, that's a different company, a different pipeline product uh, project. Where is the pipe manufactured? Uh, roughly two thirds of it is, are, is made in North America. Uh, the rest of it is sourced and specced. And then, I mean, it has to meet uh, very rigid and specific uh, criteria, technical criteria uh, from the global market. Some of it's from uh, Italy, uh, some of it's from uh, Korea. Uh, none of it is from China. Uh, yeah, but by far, the mo most of it is from North America, and a lot of that's from the United States. So, uh, there's a facility that was built primarily for this project uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the majority of what's made in North America comes out of that plant. What is mixed with the bitumen? Well, uh, it, it, it's uh, there's synthetic oil added to it that assists in in. Uh, uh, its delivery uh, that sort of speaks to the, the question earlier about heating the oil um, that the, the, uh, the synthetic oil that's added to the raw product um, helps in, in pushing it and in, in uh, delivering it through the uh, pipeline um, there are very specific criteria technical specs uh, as to what what the oil is like that that oil has to meet those specs before we put it in the pipeline. So in other words, you know, you hear the phrase oil sands all the time, and that makes it you think there's all this kind of sand in it, and that's gonna damage the interior of the pipe. That, first of all, from a common sense standpoint, that makes no sense whatsoever. Why would we spend $14 billion to build a pipeline system and then put a product in that's, that's going to damage it? Um, and we don't. And, um, uh, and also keep in mind that uh, a lot of the oil is from the United States and that is not oil sands. It's the sweet stuff. President Obama has claimed credit for approving the construction of the pipeline from Cushing, Oklahoma to the Texas Gulf Coast. What's the truth? <laughs> well, the truth, is we're, the truth is we're going to build the pipeline. <laughs> We appreciate his support. We're glad he understands the value of it. <laughs> but we're going to build the pipeline now. Is North America ever going to be truly energy independent, or is this just a dream? Why or why not, in your opinion? I hope so. We've got enough natural gas in this Haynesville shell, the Barnett shell, the Eagleford. What a beautiful shell place south of San Antonio. Heavy, heavy natural gas, liquids, oil, and dry gas. Uh, but the, the environmentalists are just choking this country down, in my opinion. They're killing us. And, and they're getting the kiddos. They're getting the Sesame Street crowd. And they grow up as non-hydrocarbon folks. I'm getting on my soapbox, I'll shut up. If we've got enough natural gas, Boone Pickens is right. What he's saying is exactly right. Between wind power for electricity, natural gas for vehicles, we, there ought, we ought to be driving natural gas vehicles in my opinion. But Shane, let me just uh, cast in an editorial comment here. T. Boone Pickens needs to use his own money and not taxpayer money to get I, the project I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll agree with you. But his concept of natural gas, I'm with you on that. 
In the face of increasing government regulation plus government efforts to promote alternative energy, can you recommend a career in the oil and gas industry to a young person entering the workforce today? Sounds like a parent who desperately wants the kid to go. <laughs> hey, I'm the father of three daughters. And this one right here, he's got several kids and they're in college right now, so he could probably answer that better than I. But let me tell you, there are a lot of colleges, I'm looking at colleges for my oldest right now, that have energy-related uh, business, uh, 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 what's the uh, code, code degrees, if you will, through business school, uh, that are driving kids to the Bakken Shell in North Dakota when they get through into the big companies. And it's a great future for those kiddos that want to play in that arena. Thank you, Jim. I, I completely agree. I, I've got five kids. My oldest just turned 25. My youngest is 12 going on 13. I've, I've suggested to the oldest ones that, you know, as you try, as they went through college and tried to figure it out, as they do, as we all did, or as I did, and there is so much going on in energy that, you know, you don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to be a technical uh, guru. You don't have to work uh, out in the fields that type of thing. There's just so much going on going on in energy right now that it's it's an enormous opportunity. So I actually would highly encourage any 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 kid who is interested in energy. And if they really want to go to work and work their hands, go up to Williston, North Dakota, where the unemployment rate is about 0.9%. It, it's that's the Bach and play. It is like a gold rush up there. They've got their own issues in terms of you know municipal services, cost of housing, cost of you know if you want to make 15, 20 bucks working at McDonald's, that's the place to go. But if you're going up there, you would work have to work hard not to get work. It's crazy. <laughs> Is it true that Warren Buffett controls oil transport by rail from North Dakota, and he would lose big time if the pipeline goes through? Obama's supporting him, I believe. What's the editorial comment? Well, it's, it's been pointed out to us that... Uh, the biggest winner? Burlington? Yeah. Burlington Northern. I, keep, I always get them confused with another one. Uh, moves a lot of that oil uh, by rail out of the Bakken. Burlington Northern is owned by Berkshire Hathaway. I'm just telling you the facts. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to leave it right there. Okay, some of these questions are ones that we've already answered about what can be done over the pipeline project, what's the depth, etc. I want people to understand because we've got some guests here today and I don't want them to think that Ms. Fleming is uh, slanting the questions. Was the problem with transgressing the aquifer in the northern states on the U.S.-Canadian border resolved and if so, how? I think that's a question regarding Nebraska and the Ogallala Aquifer and the concerns up there about this project crossing the Ogallala, which stretches, if you looked at a map of the Ogallala, <coughs> it is, uh, covers pretty much the entire Midwest. And in the state of Nebraska alone, given all the controversy of this project, you would think that this was the only pipeline that would ever cross the Ogallala Aquifer. In Nebraska, there are 20,000 miles of pipeline across the Ogallala Aquifer already. So uh, we're not the first, we won't be the last. And um, uh, it is virtually impossible to cross any state, almost any part of the country, without crossing an aquifer. And I, th and I think it's fair to say, you know, and, and this goes back to my comment earlier, Joanne, and I'll, I'll be quick here about the the Gulf, uh, the explosion in, in the Gulf Coast, or in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, and the oil rig down there, and that video, day after day after day of the oil spewing out of the bottom of the, the Gulf Coast uh, floor, and I think uh, that seemed to plant a seed and create this perception that these aquifers are these vast underwater oceans, and you know if you know anything about geology, and I don't. But I do know that they're not. You know, there's there's several hundred, if not thousands, of feet deep. Most of them. There are some that are shallower, obviously. But pipelines are above and, and around them already. So this is not a, a new concept at all. And uh, that's factored into design and location and the route and operations of a pipeline like Keystone. 
Do the landowners receive any compensation after the initial payment for the easement? Uh, yeah, there's uh, additional compensation in the form of uh, crop loss and crop damages, if that's the case. You know, we, we recognize that it usually takes two, three, four, sometimes maybe five years, depending on weather conditions, for the yield to return to pre-construction levels. Uh, our job is to compensate the landowner to make them whole as if they were getting 100% yield on that property. You've already uh, commented on this, but I thought I would emphasize it. Last night on the news, one landowner objected because nothing larger than a four-wheeler could be driven over the pipeline. Please comment. False. Here's a good one. There are many rare and endangered species. How are these issues going to be dealt with? Well, that, that's, that's part of the permitting process that we're in right now with the, the Bureau of uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, you know, following the, uh, the NEPA process, the National Environmental Policy Act process. And the, uh, there's there's uh, no shortage of uh, considerations, permit and regulatory considerations along those lines. So it's pretty well spelled out for us. We've, we've got to jump through those hoops. Yeah. Joanne, if I may pay attention to the sagebrush lizard in the Permian Basin on the other side of the state and how it will bring drilling and pipeline movement of, of oil and gas out of the Midland Odessa area. How is all of a sudden we've got a, 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 a lizard that's trying to be listed out there in eastern New Mexico, West Texas, that will bring that area of the state to its knees if that sagebrush lizard is listed? And it, 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 those are some harmful federal overreaching regulations in this guy's opinion. Sorry, Joanne, just my soapbox had nothing to do with these taxes. That's okay. How are leaks detected? And is there, and this question is the same thing, is there any way to mon monitor for leaks? To be proactive, I guess. Oh, it's monitored on a 24 7 basis. Uh, there are 16,000 monitors. Uh, send data back to the control center on a real-time basis uh, and if we detect some sort of you know if the pressure is operating like this and suddenly there's a drop and it stays there for a couple of minutes or so the guy's back it's like, it looks like something out of you know Houston mission control where if we've got a problem Houston uh, in this case it's in Calgary they can a few clicks and a few button pushes shut down the pipeline close a couple of valves on either part either side of where do we think that is and shut down the pipeline within nine to 12 minutes. And uh, because the oil is pretty thick, it's not going very far if there is any sort of release. Where can we find a detailed map of where the pipeline is to go through East Texas? Well, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame. Yeah. Uh, there are maps on our website uh, there are certainly a lot more detailed maps uh, that will be available uh, going forward. That's a bit of a, you know, a, a something of a trick bag for us because uh, when we file the uh, emergency response plan, which we, we are required to file and prepare before we begin operations, all that information is in there. But uh, because of Homeland Security and, and national security issues, detailed maps about the exact locations of the pipeline are, you know, I don't know if classified is the right word, but they're not part of that. They're not accessible necessarily. We try and provide as much information as we can without crossing that line uh, that violates the Homeland Security Act. Okay, we have just a few more left, guys, because we've had a lot of duplicates. Where is the pressure inside? What is the pressure inside your pipeline? Uh, the operating pressure is about 1,400 psi, give or take, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, but keep in mind, because this oil is so thick, it's so viscous, that when it leaves a pump station, it's leaving at a psi of about 1,400. It's high pressure. When it gets to the next pump station, 50 miles downstream, it gets to that pump station, and the psi has dropped all the way down to 50, 50, and then it gets pushed again and keeps. That's why it moves so slow. Uh, this oil in its raw form is uh, pretty thick stuff. Uh, if, uh, if anybody's a chemical engineer, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, 
Uh, viscosity is measured in, in something called centistokes. Centistoke of water is one. The centistoke of the oil in our pipeline is about 350. Is abrasion a concern? Well, it's a concern in the fact that uh, the oil that goes in the pipe has to meet criteria that reduces that risk. Uh, we're not going to put you know, rocks and raw stuff in there that are going to damage the inside of it. I think that's also one of those uh, myths that's out there, that it's oil sands, therefore sand is going in the pipeline and it's going to damage the pipeline. Not the case at all. How thick is the wall of the pipe? It varies from just under a half an inch to uh, oh, roughly five-eighths to three-quarters of an inch. It just depends on uh, whether it's a road crossing, railroad crossing, going through an uh, environmentally sensitive area. But the, the thickness of the steel is, is not so much the issue as it is the strength. Uh, the, the technology and the, and the materials that are available today are quite a bit different than pipelines from you know 50 years ago. And quite frankly, two-thirds of the pipe, if not three-quarters of the pipe, I can't remember what the fraction is now, uh, it's more than a majority, it's at least two-thirds of pipe in the ground today were manufactured and placed in service before 1970. So when you hear about bridges and roads falling apart, think about pipelines as well. A lot of that pipe's been in the ground for 40, 50, 60 years. This person says, I understand that the Gulf Coast has returned to pre-BP spill conditions much earlier than expected. How has this improved public perception? Well, I, I, saw, I think I saw that story about a month ago as well. Um, I'm not sure it's had much of an impact, quite frankly, on us anyway, because we've got our own set of circumstances to deal with. So um, I think that's a good thing, though. I think that uh, uh, has recovered a lot faster than people thought it would. <laughs> Since the product will be sold to the highest bidders, how does this help our gas prices? It's pretty uh, basic in terms of supply and demand. Uh, re uh, increasing supply and, and reducing from friendly, reliable trading sources uh, like Canada and, and the Bakken, uh, and reducing supply from unreliable sources uh, can only help uh, the supply and meet the demand here. Uh, it's been looked at again and again and again, uh, not by us, uh, by other uh, experts, uh, both at the federal government level and, and energy think tanks, uh, and they've all concluded that uh, it, it can only put downward pressure on gas prices. Now, is it going to drop the price a buck, 50 cents a quarter overnight? There's so many moving parts in what you know drives the price of the pump. Um, I, I can't say. I, I guess the only thing I would point to is look at what prices did after the hurricanes in 2005. They went up like that because the oil tankers were basically parked out in the Atla Atlantic. They couldn't get to the Gulf Coast refineries. There was no Keystone Pipeline supplying oil. The refineries weren't damaged. They just couldn't get their supply. So when that supply chain is interrupted, prices went up overnight. And uh, Part of the reason we're seeing prices go up right now is that some refineries around the country are shutting down um, for a lot of different reasons. So there's so many different moving parts in what determines the price of the pump and the barrel. It's, it's hard to pinpoint one pipeline project is having a, exactly how much impact it can have. But I think the general conclusion is, is it will put downward pressure on prices. And also don't forget that refineries are required to switch to boutique blends. Uh, during the summer months as part of your government regulation. That drives up the cost as well. Do oil sands sink or float on water? Uh, <laughs> that, that is a, a, a boy, uh, that is one of those hard questions to answer. The, the short answer is uh, it shouldn't sink and doesn't sink uh, because uh, it, it's got, you know, a, gravity and again it's getting into an area that is not necessarily my strength uh, but it my understanding is that uh, based on the analysis of the experts on it uh, that should not be an issue uh, the second part of this question is are there any implications for shallow aquifers uh, if we avoid them no <laughs> <laughs> and we try and avoid shallow aquifers that's the idea Okay, this looks like the last question. Are pumping stations below the surface, and if so, how are they monitored? 
pump stations are not below the surface. They're, they're, that's, that is frankly the only property that we buy. Um, and as Shane alluded to, uh, it's, it's, those facilities are a benefit to the local communities uh, as well. Uh, that's property of about five to seven acres that we purchase. And several things have to line up. Willing seller, road access, access to the grid, either existing or new. And um, uh, all those facilities are above, uh, at grade, above ground. Okay. Everybody got your questions answered? Yep. All right. Okay. Well,